Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 159, which is an introduction to paleontology with Professor Roy Plotnick of the University of Illinois, Chicago. So leading this interview is another of our new team members, Dr. Nick Lupsha. So hello, Nick, welcome to the team. Hi Dave, thanks. Thanks so much, glad to be here. So we're gonna need an introduction to you. So uh, could you just give us an overview of who you are? Yeah, sure. So I'm an evolutionary biologist. I come from Slovenia where I'm also currently working and employed by the Biological Institute of the Scientific Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, I did my bachelor's in Ljubljana, Slovenia, then went on to Ireland to pursue my postgraduate degree where I worked on the phylogenetics of cuttlefishes. And I finished my PhD in Prague, where I actually studied the development and evolution of visual gene expression in deep sea fishes. Basically, how the fish is living in the so-called dark sea. Um, yeah, now uh, currently based at my job, I mostly deal with um, genetics, um, and I've got I'm involved in different projects from the sexual selection in spiders to population genetics in butterflies. I'm now applying for some projects on reptiles. Um, so yeah, very dynamic. And all of that stuff, I have absolutely zero idea about. And and this is a really interesting point that we're, we're both looking at the the history of life, the evolution of life on the planet, but we're we're coming from very very different places. So with Nick as an evolutionary biologist and me as a paleontologist, but with a geological background, um, we decided it would be a great opportunity to explore the difference between each of these subjects. And so over the next couple of interviews, we're going to be swapping, we're going to be putting on each other's shoes and getting an introduction to each other's field. Yeah, so we've each prepared questions for each other to ask a leading researcher in our respective areas. So. Um... I was speaking to Roy, a paleontologist, and uh, later Dave's going to be talking to Professor Bree Rosenblum, an evolutionary biologist from UC Berkeley. And whilst we're on the subject of introductions, we always like to share our platform and introduce you to the latest new shows in our Paleo Podcast plug. You're listening to Weird and Dead, the paleontology podcast that tells evolution's most embarrassing and bizarre stories. I'm Megan Weatherell. And I'm Amy Atwater, and we are two living scientists who are weirdly excited about dead things. Here is a teaser clip from one of our episodes. The animals that we lost during the PT uh, extinction are maybe why it's not quite as popular. Because <laughs> I what was looking through. What are you talking and about? I was like, oh my god! One of the really great representatives of what died during the Permo-Triassic boundary Rugos corals. What? I know. I can't imagine why that is not such a charming representation of life that we haven't like erupted into mourning. Where's my Rugos Park movie? <laughs> yeah, there. What is a Rugos coral? Amy? <laughs> Time for the hottest tea from prehistory, served up starting January twenty fourth, twenty twenty four, via the Geology Podcasting Network. So please do check out Weird and Dead from wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, we've got pictures to accompany this episode on our website. And please like, share and leave us a comment, all of which will really help us uh, to reach new audiences. And obviously, I hope you enjoy this episode. Right. Hi, Roy. Thanks for joining me. I'm super excited to have you here. So, how are you? All good. Just watching it snow outside my window here. Um, cool. Shall we start by way of introduction? How about you give us a little bit of info about yourself? So, who are you? What do you do? And, well, does it make you happy? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, name is Roy Plotnick. I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where I've been since 1982. Uh, I'm a paleontologist, and I'm going to use that in the broad sense. So I guess we'll do a deep dive into that as we go forward. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I guess that's just the start. Here we go. And I'm happy. <laughs> cool. And was being a paleontologist always an ambition of yours? No. Um, I wanted to, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist, but I wanted to be an astronomer. Oh. And, um, you know, I read every book I could about astronomy. I uh, had a telescope uh, when I was pretty young. I still own it. Mm-hmm. And I, all the way, I guess, through high school, I wanted to be an astronomer. And then I discovered um, the amount of math that was required. And I, I had, you know, I was had math skills. I had taken calculus in high school. But uh, the way I put it to people then, and I still do, is... Astronomy is astrophysics, is physics, is math. And what you want to do is be able to think about the universe in mathematical terms. And I couldn't make that jump. I didn't have that level of math skills. So um, I trans- transformed myself into an amateur astronomer, which I still am. Mm-hmm. But um, I really didn't come into paleontology until I was in college. Um, in high school, I had attended a lecture about um, the, and these are the early days of plate tectonics. So it just became very exciting about how when the Mediterranean dried up. And I said, oh, that's a really interesting subject. And I'd also gone to a local aquarium and I looked at uh, whales. I said, oh boy, maybe I'll do something in biology. So I started in college as a biology major and I was interested in organisms, but all they would talk about is cells and molecules, which fundamentally was not that interesting to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I transferred myself into a geology major. Uh, but I also, uh, for financial support reasons, was a um, what we call a work-study student. I had a job. I didn't like it very much. Uh, it was not a very interesting job. And I read an article uh, by uh, Niles Eldridge, who may, you may have heard of as the one of the developers of, of the theory of punctuated equilibrium and, and about trilobites in the magazine Natural History. And I mentioned this to my mother. And she said, why don't you call him up and see if he has a job for you? And as it turns out, and I'm giving you a very short version of the story, he did. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So in my freshman year, I ended up working for Niles Eldridge and looking at trilobites and reading about punctuated equilibrium and cladistics and the rest is my history. But um, I don't think I'm unusual in that. Um, in, In the book I've written, I talked to a lot of my colleagues about how they started out. And a lot of them were, you know, I, people who had lived in an area where there were a lot of fossils around and they grew up collecting fossils or they you know love dinosaurs since they were little kids but i think just as many of them you know found it when later in life when they were in very often in college when they took a class Mm -hmm. and said this is kind of fun this is neat this is much more interesting than studying economics or you know maybe art or whatever i was doing agree completely so if it weren't for paleontology you'd become an astronomer that would have been the most likely path. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So what is your paleontological career focused on so far? What you've been up to? Oh, boy. You know, this is, I, I've always joked when people ask me what it is uh, you work on, I go, nobody knows. <laughs> uh, because I, and on the other way, to, I sort of flippantly answer is I everything except dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, yeah. I've stayed well <laughs> away from 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 dinosaurs. But, um, you know, I've done my doctoral thesis is on sea scorpions, the Eurypterids. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I took a long hiatus from working on them. And I'm back to been working on them now. I've written several papers in recent years on them and more are planned. So I'm back working on them. Cool. That must must make Dave happy. It must make Dave very happy. Yes. And uh, last year I published a paper on... uh, a fossil that had been long interpreted as a jellyfish. It is actually a sea anemone mm-hmm. uh, and the only common sea anemone in the fossil record. Um, I'm going to be preparing actually a couple of abstracts uh, meetings I'm going to be talking at 
Uh, one is on the fossil record of uh, primates, um, uh, the future fossil record. What will the fossil record of primates look like in the far, I mean, let's say a million years from now, as a way, as this is a follow up to some earlier papers I've published, trying to say, how can we compare the extinctions going on today, what's going on in the past? And one way to do that is to say, what that is, the organisms that are alive today, can we predict will be fossils in the future? So, a paleontologist looking back at today's extinction can compare with what went on before. Okay. Uh, the other one is a follow-up to a paper I published some years ago, uh, and this is on um, what I call information revolutions in the history of life. The idea that organisms as they, and this is part of my work on trace fossils, that organisms as they uh, move, they are sensing, they move because they sense the environment. Mm-hmm. And this environment has, uh, they have signals that they take in and they use that to interpret. And every organism has a different type of signal that they get. This is a, was uh, called a number of years ago, the umwelt of an organism. Uh-huh. What I see and what my cat smells and what the, the insects outside and the birds contact, sensory biology is different. So, but that has evolved over time. As the as the world itself has evolved, so in the before the Cambrian, there were no organisms with macroscopic sense organs. Mm-hmm. That was a major shift that of for those to develop. So now I'm extending that to uh, the conquest of the land, the origin of eukaryotes, and so on. So I I guess the one word is eclectic. I'm I'm interested in a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. So, what about the future fossil record? It's just going to be us, chicken, and cows, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the the ninety more than ninety percent of the modern mammalian biomass is us and our domestic animals, cows and chickens and sheep, and the chance of a modern wild animal getting preserved in the fossil record is very small. So, it's going to be us and our animals, and and yeah, and chickens. <laughs> And it's also because of the way we, we get rid of things and we bury them. We've created unique conditions of burial. So it, it's, it's going to be a, there's going to be a very strong Anthropocene signal mm-hmm. in the future fossil record. Interesting. And things that are going extinct won't be seen at all. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, yeah, let's touch the basics of paleontology then. So, um, can you easily define what paleontology is? Like, what areas does the subject cover, and is it very diverse? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I the way I, I've, and again, I'm sort of stealing my own book's title, the paleontologists are explorers of deep time. Uh-huh. We are the people who look at the history of life on Earth using fossils to do so. So, uh, we, we study fossils, but we do so so that we can go back and, and re- cover what the history of life on Earth has been. Because the direct, the direct evidence we have is the fossil record. Um, and we know the history of life, and, this is, and again, you get diversity. We, anything that has ever lived that leaves a fossil that can leave a fossil behind us is something we study. I liked, there's a definition that uh, K. Behrensmeyer uh, and Sue Gidwell, K. Bob Gestaldo came up back in 2000 about a fossil is any non living biologically generated trace or material that paleontologists study as a part of the record of life. Uh-huh. So anything that ever lived and anything that, that living things produced that left a record behind is what we study. So it's it's more than bones and more than shells and more than teeth, but it could be everything from a molecule to a, a footprint or a boring. Um, so it's really, really, really diverse in terms of the, the kinds of things we look at. You know, I say, you know, dinosaurs make up a tiny fraction of the history of life. <laughs> well, yeah. This whole a whole billions of years of history is that, that that we can study. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, and as an evo bio 
person, I've always sort of considered paleontology to be super intertwined with a, with evolutionary biology because you know you study you can study great transitions in life and how organisms change through time. Now the question here would be how much of paleontology is actually earth sciences and how much is biology? So is it better for a paleontologist to have a background in geology, biology, ideally both? What's your opinion on the matter? Ideally, both. And obviously there is a balance. There are paleontologists and many of my vertebrate paleontology colleagues are like this, who hardly ever look at the geological record, uh, go out and do the field work in that um, they are interested in the, bio, uh, the paleobiologists per se, mm -hmm. the people who do the large database studies, the people who do large phylogenetic studies. Um, they are um, heavily based on working with the biologic, you know, fossils as the remains of living things. And so there's a large part of that. And then there are the people who are going out and looking at uh, the Devonian stratigraphy of Slovenia. And they <laughs> use fossils to tell them how old the rocks are. And they use fossils to tell them what environments the rocks are in. But you can't, you have to do both because the fossil record, the record of the fossils is, is, is affected by the geological processes. You can't make sense of what the fossils are telling you unless you understand the physical, geological, geochemical processes that have influenced the fossil record. I, I hate to use the word bias, but the fossil record is modified, the light record of life, by geological processes. And so you have to be aware of them in order to fully understand what's going on. The entire science of taphonomy, the study of fossil preservation, is essential to knowing what's going on in, in uh, the record. There's a, you know, just an example, there's a whole debate now about Tyrannosaurus rex versus Nanotyrannus, and I'm not gonna get involved in that, but a lot of that is going to understand how Dinosaurs are preserved, what part of their life history is preserved, and so on in the rock record, what is distorted, what is um, uh, left behind, and so on. You can't do that kind of work without knowing where the fossils are coming from geologically. So there's, there's a large part of that, too. Uh, the other part of this, and, I, and this is absolutely, you know, I, I like to read a see if I can find it quickly here. Yeah, sure. This is a quote from Charles Marshall. So, um, in the absence of the fossil record, we would <clears throat> not know that the first tetrapods were not fully terrestrial, nor that they had more, more than five digits per limb, that the first lungfish were marine, that fivefold symmetry is not ancestral for echinodermis, that many of the synapromorphies of living birds evolved before flight, nor could have inferred the unexpected morphology of Ardipithecus, which lies close to the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of questions in evolutionary biology that we could not answer without the fossil record. A uh, recent example came up of you know, the tremendous diversity of insects on plants and how much of that is driven by um, the numbers of plants versus niche partitioning within the plants themselves. Uh -huh. And this study showed that use fossil record to get a, an answer to that kind of question. So there are a lot of basic evolutionary questions, which if you have biology as an ahistorical science, you could not answer. You need the paleontologist to tell you what is going on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep rambling here. Um, the other part, too, is, and this is the way, uh, the way I like to put this, paleontologists know what happens when things go bad. Yeah. We are the scientists who know more than anything else. When the Earth's environment goes to hell, what happens to the biosphere? Mm. When massive volcanic eruptions occur, 
when carbon dioxide levels rise, when asteroids hit, name the disaster. You know, uh, <laughs> when we have massive climate shifts, we know how life has changed, ex gone extinct, evolved, adapted, whatever you want, terms you want to use to those particular changes in the history of life. Yeah, and it's powerful. So if we're going to predict what's going on in the future, we need to know the context that paleontologists provide. Um, so the way I'm, I, I like to put this, without uh, students, a biology student today needs to know about the history of life on Earth as much as they know or need to about, about the gene in the cell. Yeah. And Earth scientists today need to know about what fossils say about how life has adapted as much as they need to know about, you know, atmospheric science. Um, mm -hmm. So we know what's happened before. And, and, and plus, of course, a lot of the data on climate change over time is paleontological. There was a paper that just came out last week on the Cenozoic history of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh-huh. Okay. And that record is heavily based on paleontological information. So essential for biology, essential for, for earth science. And I guess the field is quite interdisciplinary. I mean, you've got physics in paleontology, you've got chemistry, all the discipl scientific disciplines are intertwined, right? Oh, yeah. And um, I know I used to do phylogenetics as well, and I know that um, people use the fossil record to also use, use it for molecular dating, right? To estimate how old some lineages are and stuff like that. So, yeah, paleontology is quite important for evolutionary biology. Yeah, it, it, establishing the divergence times is based heavily on on the fossil record. Um, you know, there have been a lot of studies showing that just simply using uh, tip day, you know, uh, trying to do birth death processes without recognizing the re re reality of extinction gives you bad results. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we are by nature by we sit at across a whole bunch of of of, of fields of science. We're multidisciplinary, we're interdisciplinary, um, yet we have to know physics. Um, I did a lot of my research on uh, biomechanics of, a of organisms, and I had to learn a lot about fluid mechanics to understand that. You're scaring people off now, Roy. <laughs> well, you know, this is, I'm saying this is not what you have to do, but this is what you can do. <laughs> so, you know, it's yeah. fun to do, it's do, you can, paleontology can be experimental. You can do experiments either uh, with real equipment like I did or people now doing it with um, uh, computer models of fluid flow or physics to look at uh, how organisms worked in the past. Um, but there are also people using incredibly sophisticated analytical equipment, uh, various kinds of spect spectrometer work uh, to do uh, analysis of what fossils are made out of. So we can understand and, and look at ancient chemistries and so on. So um, again, in my own work, I just off the again. This is uh, a number of years ago. I discovered an incredibly well preserved Pennsylvanian age cave deposit. Mm -hmm. Caves usually don't preserves, and this was a cave that had been filled in the Pennsylvanian. And when is that exactly? About three hundred million years ago. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So imagine there was a cave and then rivers came over and filled the cave in and it carried in spores of the plants that were living on the surface of the land and little pieces of, of cuticle of scorpions that were living on the surface of the land and using, I didn't do this, but co uh, colleagues with the equipment, including synchrotrons, were able to determine that the uh, spores, we, we preserved the original spore pollen and coat and the scorpions had the original chitin. Oh, wow. But this is, you know, again, you have to know chemistry to do that kind of work. Okay, so we've covered a lot of things now. Um, what do you think is the distinction between a paleontological sample and a historical one? Is there, wh where does the paleontology end and history begin? 
Uh, I always like to be facetious. We don't, fossils are that we are things that are dead things that don't smell anymore. <laughs> okay. Of course, some fossils do smell. Um, you know, it's it's the, it used to be said that you know paleontology starts when before the historical record, but of course the historical record is different in different types of the world. So I don't really use that. I don't really think that division is, is valid. Mm-hmm. Um, it go. It, it's a fuzzy beginning, fuzzy end. And again, many paleontologists study things going on right now. There's a whole field of conservation paleont- paleobiology, which is trying to apply paleontological methods to modern conservation issues. Um, this is looking at, uh, for example, uh, the vegetation that used to live in California or the uh, impact of the damming of the Colorado River on shells at their um, at the at where it enters into the Gulf of California. So this is a using modern day using the methods and tools and concepts of paleontology, but to recognize that we can apply those tools to conservation problems, which is our today problems, but they also go back to historical times. Uh, Susan Kidwell and her worked on and a colleague worked on uh, the impact of the Spanish settlement in California on the brachiopod communities off the California coast. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's an artificial division. I don't think it's one we really need to worry about. Okay, Roy. So um, what do you think? Are there any biases within paleontology? As you said before, paleontology is not all about dinosaurs. It's not only dinosaurs. Um, what are the biases? Uh, a, a lot of there's been a lot of work coming out in the last couple of years, actually, on uh, geographic biases. So again, if you make a map of where fossil localities are, they tend to be North America and Europe uh, and parts of Asia. China. Well, try try. China is putting on incredible amount of new research recently, in the last uh-huh. dec- couple decades. But um, most of the global south is still, though there are some wonderful paleontologists in places like Argentina and Brazil, uh, or in a- Egypt or South Africa, uh, most of the global south is still missing in its record uh, and underrepresented because there aren't the people there or the work hasn't been done. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's a major one is a big geographic. It's also related biases about who's doing the science. Again, tends to be dominated by uh, you know people of European descent uh-huh. in both the uh, United States and in Canada and in Australia and Europe. Uh, we are becoming more diverse in that respect. Um, gender diversity, you know, the science has certainly increased since I started out. Um, we are having again. I know most North American paleontology best, of course. Uh, representation by people of uh, from of Latino background, a Hispanic background has increased tremendously. African American, Black background, still very rare. They exist, but we're still not ethnically or di- racially diverse in the science as we should be. We're getting more gender diverse, but even that is still lagging behind, especially in the more senior ranks. Um, Oh, in terms of overstudied or relatively ignored, again, again, it's it's there's a lot of work on dinos. <laughs> there are whole groups of organisms which no longer have people working on them. I mean, this is part of we can talk about this a little bit later, but we have had a real erosion, especially in the invertebrate paleontology ranks, of areas of specialization. So there are entire Groups of organisms, which at least in in North America have nobody working on them, even a group like thing like trace fossils, uh, there really isn't anybody. There's only one or two places throughout North America where there are people who could turn out a PhD student who wants to work on trace fossils. Um, very rare to find people working on particular groups. Uh, fossil corals, um, trilobites, still fairly common. Brachiopods, you know, but it's it's. We've lost expertise over time, and there's an erosion of that. So I think that we've sort of covered the relevance of uh, paleontology scientifically, but still, is how is its importance 
for example, reflected in the support and funding. I know in my case, in the case of evolutionary biologists, it does, I, I mean, there are countries that offer more funding than others, but in general, it's always lack of funding that's problematic. How is it in paleontology? It's, it's, a, it's a very bad situation. Um, you know, I like to say the entire budget for paleontology from the federal government the United in, for the National Science Foundation is less than some big national uh, single grants in the health area. Um, when we, it's, it's, um, we're a small fraction of a small fraction of the federal budget uh, for, the, for that kind of thing. There is funding. It does exist, but um, the grants are very, very hard to get, and they're not that large. So it is not a great funding situation, which impacts us down the line, because again, with hiring in the in uh, in many universities, they are saying how much money you could, how many grants can you big in, bring in, and what size. Even though, yeah. for the most part, we don't cost a lot. In terms of our research, mm -hmm. you know, where we give and we give great results for the money, we give bang for the buck. But um, the uh, our total funding package is just not anywhere near. And it, the one that really bugs me, I can, I mean, this is a pet pet peeve, but things like um, the Jurassic Park and Jurassic Mer World movies and the Meg, it's another movie, so they make literally hundreds and hundreds, even close to a billion dollars. And very little of that money trickles down to the people who provided the science that those films are based on. It'd be nice to have a little bit, to have more funding than we have now. You know, of course, everybody's always going to say that, but it's, it's, a, it's not a very good situation. And why do you think that is? Um, part of it is a prejudice. Again, Part, uh, you know, again, one of the, one of the reasons I write my blog and I've written this book that I've written is I think there is a idea of paleontologists first among the public as being dinosaur dinosaur paleontologists. People going out, and I like to put the image of the, you know the white guy, middle aged with a beard and a, and a cowboy hat, going out <laughs> banging on rocks with a hammer looking for dinosaurs. Yeah. And so uh, there is an idea of, of there's really not much understanding of what it is we do, the diversity of things we do, the importance of the things we do. And then there is this bias of, in among our colleagues in earth sciences and the other sciences, oh, this is an old science. It's, 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 it's out of date. You know, that paleontology isn't relevant. You know, it's a bunch... Well, what did Luis Alvarez call it? Stamp collecting. You know, all you do is you describe new species. Yeah. Part of that is also the um, impact the uh, that when you see paleontology in the news media, they're reporting on new discoveries, a new fossil that's been found somewhere that you know upends our view of the history of life. That you know that kind of thing, but that does not really give it gives a very distorted view of what it is we actually do what we do with those discoveries once we find them and how they fit into the big picture so i think a lot of this is just people look at paleontology and go well okay you know it's kind of cool and kids like dinosaurs but you know what why it's not cool and exciting and cutting edge mhm mm i get it yeah which is incorrect but it's something we have to we have to uh, overcome. Um, so what, what relevance does it have to the average person on the street then today? Well, again, you have to explain to people that, you know, if you're interested in what's going on in the world today, if you're interested in how, my, you know, the fact that this was last just the hottest year on record uh -huh. and carbon dioxide levels have not been this high in 20 million years. You have to say, well, what was, what, you know, when things were last like this, what were things like? And you start to ask that question, say, well, is it your relevance? This is going to, this is going to give us a good insight in what the future is going to be like for us. And we also understand that, you know, as you walk around outdoors, 
and you go to a place like a nature preserve or a national park to understand that this was you're seeing only a fraction of what was actually there that uh, that if you actually had been there 20,000 years ago there'd be mammoths and mastodons you know to give an idea of of uh that there is a history of lot of of not just the earth itself but where you're standing is important to me to the, the local person but again i think the big thing is just to to know that we are the ones who know the history of life and the history of of earth it and earth's changes and as climate changes we know what life has done in the past when climate has changed and even in the cases where we can say this has never happened before i think it's important for us to say that so basically paleontology is more applicable than people think right yeah yeah i think it's a highly relevant field um we have skills we have knowledge we have critical perspectives how would you make paleontology more popular what would you do we're already very popular obviously one one thing is listen to paleocast right yeah of course but you know paleontology of course but paleontology is very popular i mean you know it's it's um if you go to uh listen to the field museum for example here in chicago they will start off their advertisements uh coming say come see sue the t-rex which we have here come see four billion years of earth history of history um our problem is not popularity with the public um again all those movies tv shows there's lots of kids shows mm -hmm. you know i i don't know if you see them here but it, where you live but there's lots of children's tv shows uh that are dinosaur themed um and so you know children love it and they're excited about it adults if they'll all tell yeah, you i grew up loving dinosaurs they still do it and they get to go to the museum. It's exciting to see the fossils. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's not popularity. I think that's, that's going to be our issue. Um, it's, I think if there is, again, as I said, um, trying to give a broader perspective of what it is and what we do, it, that would be great. But in terms of just overall, you know, the, I guess the only really downside is – People confuse us with the archaeology all the time. <laughs> you know, you know, um, one of my and uh, we're not Indiana. Indiana Jones was not a paleontologist. Okay, and how can you explain it to the view to the listeners? What's the difference then? Well, it, why are you not an archaeologist? Archaeologists deal with the what humans produced. The human culture and human tr history and human tradition, the, the physical remains of humans and what they produce. Many of the tools are the same. There's a lot of integration with them. A lot of paleontologists and archaeologists work together on determining the environment, for example, of, of, uh, of a cultural setting of an ancient city or even of ancient human remains. And of course, ancient human remains, uh, something like um, Australopithecus, those are fossils and they're found with fossils, other kinds of fossils. So there is a, a tie in between the two, but going out and, you know, still looking for pots, that's not us. That's, <laughs> that's archeology. span Cause that's something that, that is made by human, that is the product of human culture. We have, again, we face many of the same issues of cultural, you know, uh, where the fossils came from and yeah, as opposed yeah. to, you know, so on, but no, it's, it's a very different science in that regard. And of course, they are, there are all sorts of intellectual differences between the fields too, because it's so tied up to anthropology. Uh, so Roy, you've written a great book. Thank you. Uh, as we've discussed before and now, um, in that book, you also talk about common misconceptions about paleontology. Um, what are they? Besides, it's all about the dinos and old white bearded men with cowboy hats. Um, can you list some more misconceptions? What do people get okay, wrong? Okay, well, again, you know, the exact, um, I would say start off with the misconceptions of who's doing the science. That's the big one. It's much more diverse than that. Um, mm hmm but for many reasons again it's also much more diverse obviously in the subject area that we look at it is much more diverse in our methodologies 
again the the classic image with the with the pickaxe and the shovel and the and the whisk broom but it doesn't include the the synchrotron or the uh, the other kinds of spectrometer devices that we use or the the, the micro ct scanners or uh the high tech computers that we uh, dev- uh we use to uh analyze the basics of the fossil record or to do phylogenetics all those aspects that you know where we are sitting at the cutting edge of science that's really not included at all in that and again i think even more fundamentally that it is not about the discoveries that uh, that are really what's important discoveries are a key i mean we we that is what makes it fun makes it interesting to do but again it, it's it's that it's they help us they're part of the picture we draw we draw a broad picture of the history of life. We use the discoveries to put that picture together, but the discoveries don't stand alone. They are part of their overall picture of the history of life. And of course, that we're not archaeologists. And I always like to say, and I'm certainly, you know, if you ever watch the TV show, very popular here in the States as Friends, um, we're, not, we're not Ross either. Yeah, it's popular all over the globe. Yeah. What about the monetary value of fossils? I think quite a lot of people might associate fossils with money, I guess, right? Yeah, this is I, I call this the Sioux effect. Um the you know, when Sioux the dinosaur was found, uh, it's an incredible fossil. And it's probably worth what the Field Museum had McDonald's and I forget the other company, Disney helped them pay for it. But it, it, it created the idea that fossils are valuable in and of themselves, that they're worth something. And that's not true. The part of that, too, is the other side of that is that, oh, fossils are rare. And so, first of all, fossils are not rare. Some are, but most fossils are not rare. We build buildings out of them. And we call it limestone. <laughs> you go to any building made out of limestone, very often you're going to find fossils visible in the walls of them. So fossils themselves are not rare items. And I have fossils I collect, and I give them away to kids. So fossils themselves have no uh, – I think one of the worst things that's ever happened is fossils have become like artwork, desirable for, their, for, their, for that value alone. And it's distorted things. It's made it harder for people to go to land sites, for example. To collect because people assume, oh, you're looking for fossils. How much money am I going to get out of it? And it's also made it very hard for many of the uh, professionals, it's, again, especially for the vertebrate people, to collect fossils because they they look the if there is something that's found, the first question is how much money can I get out of doing it? And of course, it's the whole issue of buying and selling of fossils, uh, not just, of course, the big the multi-million dollar dinosaurs, but the ones you see on eBay. For example, so there is there is a distortion of the thing. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, fossils primarily have a scientific value. I have this has been a big issue between the vertebrate and invertebrate paleontology people. Vertebrate paleontologists, many of them, want no fossil sold ever. And invert paleo people say, well, you know, <laughs> fossils, common fossils, you know, if people want to get a sell them for a dollar at a at a rock show, okay. You know, I have rarely, I, I buy, there's a, the, the sea anemone I worked on, I bought fossils in the, at the flea market because they were selling them there oh, for that wow. particular fossil. So I have no, you know, I I, I don't have a problem with most fo- with, with fossils being sold overall. It's, you know, I am not happy to see something being put up for $10 million that should be in a museum. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very divisive issue. Something I learned early on in my career when I was at the American Museum is that there were three questions people ask when they, when they bring you a fossil. What is it? How old is it? How much is it worth? Assuming that the older it is, the more valuable it is. Oh, you know, well, they, they may be curious about how old it is, too. And, of course, you also have the people who come in with, you know, uh, concretions. And tell you they found a dinosaur brain or a dinosaur egg, and so on. Same pre- problem meteorite people have. But yeah, the, the monetary value is is a big issue. Hmm. 
if I find a brachiopod, it's not going to be worth a thousand dollars. Yeah, but scientifically, it might be co- quite um, important, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, on the other hand, if I've got ten thousand of them, each individual one is not. Yeah. Sure. So, Roy, if you're a student. And if you're deciding, a high school student, for example, and if you're deciding what to become, how does one become a paleontology student? How can you start a career? Okay, again, there are very few places that offer an undergraduate degree in paleontology. In fact, I'm not sure if there are any that currently exist, at least in, in uh, the, the United States or Canada, that do that. Um, you would be generally be a major in biology and ge- or, uh, or geology, or some people, places let you do both. If you're a biology, if you're interested in the more biological sciences thing, uh, you need to make sure you get a lot of training in not just, again, molecular and cellular, which is interesting and useful. Even behavioral biology be very useful. Uh, for me, it certainly has been. Um, but um, also in organismal biology and, and invertebrate paleontology, and zoology and invertebrate biology and uh comparative anatomy um one i'll just sort of as an aside mention one of the big issues that's come up in training in biology in, in, in this country has been the average biology student takes no course but has that they call an ology course ichthyology mammalogy uh invertebrate you know zoology and so on they are mostly again molecular and genetics courses so a lot of um biologists are getting trained without having any exposure not even just as a history of life, but uh, most major, you know, what, what an organism looks like as a whole thing. Yeah. So uh, in the systematics or the morphology. So, uh, but, so you need to have that for biology, you should get that kind of training. And in geology, again, uh, you need to get at least uh, the basics of an earth, system, earth history class and uh, hopefully a class in sedimentology, stratigraphy, uh, geochronology, and so on. Uh, as much diversity as you can get. Um, statistics is uh, going to be very vital to much of what's going on with, with uh, uh, the do paleontology today. Um, so ad- as diverse as an education as you can get is going to be good. And good, good background in the humanities too. I can't help to tell you that. So people have become, you know, people become paleontologists from all sorts of people from, from music backgrounds and arts backgrounds and social science backgrounds. And uh, again, you know, yeah. so there's a lot of roads to it. But uh, you don't have to be the boy, pa- the, the child paleontologist to become a paleontologist. <laughs> I would say be, being, being open too. I mean, I'm, you know. I think one of the, the cool things about, paleo, about being a paleontologist is you're not siloed. You're, not, you're open to ideas that are, oh, there's something that from this other field of science or this other field of inquiry that might be useful for paleontology. Let me look at it. Yeah. So there's still hope then for many people from other areas of research. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, um, I, the only time I've ever got, gotten irritated is it, sometimes you get people who come in from other fields. You know, I had uh, one of one of my areas of interest for a while. There was there was a whole field of uh, physics uh, called self-organized criticality and related ideas. And there were people who coming in publishing papers in physics journals, explaining evolution in the fossil record, and they never sat down and talked to a paleontologist or an evolutionary biologist about what they were doing. <laughs> but they, because they were physicists, they had explained it to you. They misconceptions about punctuated equilibrium, for example, of, that they had was were tremendous, or about the, the nature of extinctions. <laughs> what about um, conducting research? How can one get um, actively involved? Well, the first thing to do, of course, get, putting yourself. I'll just give again my own example. I started out as a freshman, and I worked at the American Museum for two and a half years. I had that opportunity because of where I was, of course, uh, at, at Columbia University. But then in my and in my senior year, I went and did research on microfossils in a radial area at uh, Lamont Dougherty. It's now the Earth Observatory. It was Geological Observatory. Then I was working on the with the the Climap program, and I was learning about radial areas and other such microfossils. So you know, there's always if there's a a, a museum, a paleo, uh, 
or a paleontologist on the faculty, they're more they're always glad to have somebody who's willing to to learn how to do some research with them and get them start get you started on it. I, you know, in general, I I'm, my colleagues I know are very happy and eager and excited to have to have young people come sit up and see them, um, and talk to them about what they want to do. So, but you got to you got to make that step. You got to be the you know go up and make that contact first and be honest about what you do and don't know and what you would like to learn yeah if you don't shoot you don't score um so in general what kind of jobs are available then to paleontologists uh, <laughs> i am the uh chair of a temporary committee of the paleontological society on employment and we are very concerned about the current status of jobs in our field we're trying to it's very, been very hard to get good data uh, especially for outside of geology departments and even for, for the many, because many paleontologists are in outside of biology. I'll talk about that in a minute. There are, of course, many uh, paleontologists in earth science departments of various kinds throughout the world. Um, and so they would be teaching paleontology in a geology department and we'd have a geologically oriented teaching that, that, that they, they do. Um, the other place is biology, biology or even anatomy or, or medical centers. I have a, there are a lot of bio, uh, vertebrate paleontologists who teach at medical schools mm -hmm. because they can teach comparative anatomy and gross anatomy with a, um, with their background. Uh, Neil Shubin, who wrote the, the wonderful book, Your Inner Fish, teaches anatomy at the University of, or taught anatomy at the University of Chicago using evolution as his, his sort of guide to why does that nerve run that way in the human head? So there's a lot of people who are in biology departments um, uh, teach. And so there's, there is that again, because if they want somebody who knows something about, you know, snails, they want an, an organismal biologist. If you have a paleontologist who has did their doctor dissertation on on snails, they can teach biology of snails. So you know, again, give, there's a lot of background that we have that could fit in in various places in academia. Um, so uh, that you know that is, that is <laughs> excuse me an advantage of us is the variety of things that we can potentially teach. So people, earth science departments. Um, and biology departments are the major places that hire. Um, it used to be many paleontologists worked for the, the oil, gas, coal industries, but that number has declined tremendously over the last several decades uh, due to changes in the technology to, of, of oil extraction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were actually looking at uh, recently, this is again a committee, uh, we were finding something like uh, – 80% of the people who have a paleontology degree were still working in paleontology a year later. Many of them elsewhere, working elsewhere in areas of science that use their skill set. Because again, you know, if you're working with a lot of paleontologists nowadays are very skilled in GIS or in uh, R programming or data analysis and or in uh, analyzing modern day communities and those skills are transferable. Hmm. That's good. Um, and have you noticed any change in paleontology over the course of your career? How has it changed? Oh, okay. We could spend a lot of time talking just about that. I, you know, the big change that I always, you know, point to in my field is when I started out, the number of, of women in the field that I knew, I, excellent women scientists, but there were very few of them. Mm -hmm. Now it's... You know, at least in the United States, becoming close to uh, among the younger paleontologists, almost almost half or more are, are are women, and that's been a big change. I mean, a huge huge shift in the gender diversity within the field. In terms of uh, the science itself, I mean, the big changes in my career is that I was a sort of a, I like to say an outside observer of the paleobiological revolution. Um, this field. The, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the onset of not just punctuate equilibrium, but starting in the 70s, but of the work of scientists like uh, Steve Gould and Dave Raup and Jack Sipkoski, 
uh, and so uh, uh, changing intellectually what the field was doing so that we were starting to get involved in big data. You know, the things like the paleobiology database, it's trying to look at not just that individual fossil occurrences, but at the uh, evidence as a whole, the fossil record as a whole, the growth of paleobiology as a whole as a discipline with the journal and so on. So, you, you know, finding a paleontologist who you know, used to say, uh, you're a paleontologist, what do you do? Oh, I work on Silurian trilobites or I work on you know, Cretaceous aminoids. That was how you characterize yourself by a group in a time period. Now you might say, oh, I work on um, the uh, character d d displacement in a particular group, or uh, I, I do high, uh, d biodiversity of a particular period of time, or you know, looking for – that's a whole bunch of high-level, highly t uh, uh, tech biological questions, evolutionary questions that now drive the field. And again, we've had – as a result, we've had a loss of – so the people who describe the fossils, but it's now much more driven by these big, bigger picture questions, and people are much more computer savvy than they used to be. Um, I would say the big, you know, I I started out as a using Fortran programming. Now everybody does R, mm -hmm. which I've never learned myself. But there's just been a lot of changes, and again, the advent of of the of the analytical tech equipment. Um, I mean, we were just starting out when, you know, we had x-rays, but the ability to take a fossil, put it under a microscope and tell you detailed distribution of elements, we couldn't do that. To take a, a rock with a fossil in it and, and not have to open it up to take a look at what was inside, but to use micro CT scanning, we couldn't do that. Just modern technology has just really made a shift. Um, even just, and I always like to point this out, I um, look doing the research on the literature, what used to take weeks to do can now be done in hours. I can put together a reading list on a subject in a very short time. It used to take a lot, just lots of time going through volumes in the library looking for, for references. And that has made things much easier. What does the future hold for the study of past life then, aside the lack of funding? Uh, well, lack, lack of funding and, and decline in positions. I mean, geology departments are just, even geology departments are disappearing these days. So there, there's this I, some existential angst, I feel, about the future of the field as a whole. Uh, there's some really bright spots. I mean, good Lord, the, the amount of, again, stuff coming out of uh, China is just, tremendous um the recognition of the contributions of people from from developing world is just going to really be important as we go forward overall diversification of the people in the field is just very very positive uh i go to meetings and i listen to my young upcoming colleagues and i am very heartened by just their energy and their abilities and their knowledge and they, you know, we have incredibly capable and smart young people in our field, and it gives me a lot of hope for what I see. I mean, I, I read some <laughs> of their papers and I have say, well, I have no idea what they're doing, but it sounds really good to me. Um, so I, I think the future is, is, is as bright as it can be. I think the advent of conservation paleobiology has been a major advance to try to say, well, you know, let's, let's use what we know to, to address modern day issues. That's a, a major issue too. So I, I, I tend to feel on an intellectual basis, I think we're as good as we're going to ever we're going to be. And there's a lot of hope and future there. It's just, we need, it'd be nice to have jobs for all these bright young people that they come out. And that works. That's what worries me. Yeah, sure. So do you think that the study of past life can actually predict the future? Oh yeah. I mean, that's, I, I like the the phrase I I've used for this is that we are we are prophets of the future because we know the past. <laughs> um, we we know what is you know we can tell you uh, what has happened in the past with as I said mentioned with environmental change with global change, and we can make predictions of that. 
Um, we can know, again, my own work is trying to predict what the fossil record of the future will look like. So yes, we can do that. We can say, I think a lot of it's going to be saying how things have happened in the past that have happened before and how things that we will see going on in the future are different. These are, you know, you, why, why what the humans are doing are, is unprecedented. Um, so I think we, we, we can do a lot about predicting the future, which is again, something that all people don't think about for paleontology. Hmm, interesting. So basically to conclude, if you had to choose which paleontological concept would you like the world to understand? If you had to choose one. Life has a history. Hmm. Start with that. If you want to say what the lesson of paleontology is, that, is that life has a history. That what we see going outside, looking around, is not the way it has been in, in the past. And just like... and. It, we have to understand that history to understand the future. Yeah, life has changed. Hmm. I, you know, I, the, 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 the one way I always put it is I go out to the local quarries here in the Ordovician or the Siluri and I pick up a fossil and I say, this thing, is, this thing was formed in a tropical sea. Do you see one around here today? No. <laughs> We've had change. Life has a history. The Earth has had a history. And again, as, as sort of as, as a, an addendum to that, you know, the history of life and of the earth are tied together. There's not two independent histories. The history of the earth and the history of life on it are one life, uh, one story. Yeah. Super interesting. Okay, Roy. Uh, well, I think that brings us to the end of our chat. Um, thank you so much for coming over and discussing with us. Thank you. I, I'm glad I had the opportunity to do so. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Liz Martin Silverstone, Tom Fletcher, Nick Lupshire, Emily Keeble, and Sophie Pollard. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, our listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll gain access to additional multimedia content, and thanks to everyone who's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs. And follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network. <laughs>